Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. A few months ago I did a video on the strange and unfortunate history of the Ataris and I thought I would do a similar video on the band Yellow Card as the history of each band actually seems to draw some parallels. Both bands have had numerous lineup changes or have gone through a hiatus or breakup of some sort. Both bands were a huge part of the 2001 to 2005 pop punk boom, the pop punk takeover. And each band actually had arguably, I would say definitely in fact, their most successful album in 2003. In fact, they were released just a few weeks apart from each other. Each band started off as a slightly heavier band. The band have actually done tours together, plus both bands were huge on the Warp Tour circuit. Yellow Card had a whole lot happen during their time as a band. They've had a hiatus, members becoming car salesmen, Ryan touring with New Found Glory, members getting kicked out in the middle of promotion for albums. Sean Mackin sadly was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, although he made a really, really epic recovery from that and it didn't seem to hinder his performance whatsoever. So we're gonna talk about their history today, the ups and the downs, the things which were a little bit unfortunate, but also how they recovered and how everything sort of worked out in the end, I guess you could say. Before we do that, if you could hit the subscribe button to support the channel, honestly, it is the most important thing that you can do for the channel, more so than commenting, more so than liking, although do that as well. Solid guys, thank you so much. So after releasing three albums and two EPs, which is a really, really good work ethic, by the way, Yellow Card ended up signing to Capitol Records, which was a subsidiary of EMI. EMI is now defunct, but at the time it was one of the big four record labels, the biggest four record labels you could possibly be signed to. The other three being Sony, Warner Brothers, and Universal. And when you're on a label like that, you best believe there is some solid, solid marketing money. And this was a big turning point for the band. They were getting these big budget music videos, getting on video game soundtracks, appearing at the VMAs, and their music was getting really, really, really good rotation, which is fantastic. And needless to say, Ocean Avenue was such a banging album. Like, that is such a good album. There are so many good songs that they released around this time period. Breathing, Believe, Way Away, Ocean Avenue, Empty Apartment, Only One, it, I could go on. But I would definitely say that the one big thing which really exposed Yellow Card to a larger audience was the soundtracks. Now, if you're as old as me, I am nearly 31, by the way, you'll know that in 2001 to 2005, if you got on a video game soundtrack, that was like a rite of passage. Or maybe a movie soundtrack as well. That, that would also be really, really good. But video game soundtracks particularly. Madden, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, snowboarding games, snowmobiling games, baseball games, NHL games, you name it. Project Gotham, GTA, Need for Speed. Kids would play these games for hours and hours and hours on end, and therefore the music would be repeating itself. There's only about 10 to 20 songs on that soundtrack soundtrack and they're being played over and over and over again. And the longer that someone plays these games or the harder the level, the more time they spend on that level and therefore they keep hearing the song. And so subconsciously, they're constantly hearing this music and getting really into it. And Yellow Card were on quite a few of these soundtracks, which was really cool for them. And a lot of the songs that were on those soundtracks, a few of them were from different albums, but most of them was definitely from their breakthrough album and their blow up album, Ocean Avenue, which again, great album. So of course this, combined with the fact that it is obviously such a good album, just poof. I think the band realized this as well because even years later, they were still revolving their tours and focusing some of their live sets on Ocean Avenue, sometimes even playing the entire album in full. But sadly, the following two releases after this, Lights and Sounds and Paper Walls, seriously underperformed in comparison. And this is understandable. When you've got an album that good, it is difficult to live up to that expectation. So both critically and commercially, these albums underperformed. Violin player and backup vocalist Sean Mackin would go on to comment that the band went a little too far. And although the album wasn't a mistake, it certainly was a learning experience. 
The band have never stated or never confirmed that their 2008 to 2010 breakup or hiatus or just break from being a band was due to this, due to the fact that they had a really good album with a big record label, but then they released two more albums and they underperformed, didn't do well, people weren't into it, and the record label are like, hey guys, that's not cool. We signed you so you'd make us some money. They never said that the breakup or the break or the hiatus was due to this, However, if you look at this quote from Ryan Key, despite the fact that he states that the break is to figure out things in their personal life, and there was certainly no internal animosity within the band, he also says, it's an interesting time in this business and our record label. I don't think that you would say those exact words unless there was a problem. But it probably wasn't within the band, it was just within their salary, their contract, their relationship with the music industry, their relationship with touring. Because if you're working this hard and you're not getting good returns from it, and then your record label are giving you a bollocking for it, it doesn't make it so enjoyable anymore. Sean has actually been very open about this as well, and if you watch this clip from an interview with Talking With Soup, he actually mentions that when he became a car salesman, he was making, on average, per year, more money being a car salesman than being in a very successful and well-known band. We, there, were, there was a time uh, in our career where Yellow Card was, was making a, a lot of money. It was a very small amount of time. It was a year and a half, maybe two years. And when we took time off from Yellow Card, we had a hiatus. Uh, I sold cars for three and a half years. And uh, on average, I made more money per year selling cars than I did in the music business. So as, like a semi-responsible young adult, mm -hmm. you, once you get years under your belt of income, you start to figure out what the average is and, and what's good for you and your family and your future and things like that. And it obviously is really difficult, but I think most people are making music for the music yeah, and for the, the friendships. And, and uh, you know, we had, a, we had a couple really good years and I, I feel like I've been grateful the whole time. And uh, anyone that has supported our band, they should know that we're very thankful for that. So with all that said, before the hiatus and a little bit after the hiatus, the 2008 to 2010 break they had, there were other unfortunate things happening. So during the promotional cycle for Lights and Sounds, guitarist and I think founding member, in fact, Ben Harper was asked to leave the band. At the time, the band made it seem like he had chosen to leave, but since then, if you actually listen to interviews with Ben Harper since then, it is very much not the case. He did not intend to leave whatsoever and he does not seem very happy about it whatsoever. Because you have to remember that Ben was in the band before Sean and Ryan even joined. He even describes the band as his band and he was kicked out of it. He was invited to, I think, a hotel or a venue one day for a quote, band meeting, got one of those phone calls, hey, band meeting. He ended up going there and being asked to sign a contract that he was resigning from the band. Can you imagine that? What a kick in the teeth. It's his band. He started it. It's, well, it's partially his band. And it's a band that he was working on for over seven years. He toured relentlessly with. He had now recorded five albums and two EPs. A similar thing happened with bass player Peter Mosley, although he did actually, I believe off the top of my head, say that it was his choice to leave. Could have been with problems with other members of the band, we'll never know for certain. And then a few years later, their drummer left and interestingly started a project with Ben Harper as well. So yeah, a lot of lineup changes, a lot of lineup changes, but that's not a yellow card or a, the Atari's problem. That's a music industry problem. Lineup changes just happen left, right, and center. It's not specific to these two bands, although it is unusual for bands to have this much of a lineup change, to have 12 to 20 different members throughout your career as a band. Now let's quickly talk about post hiatus yellow card and pre permanent breakup yellow card, because this is actually where some of my favorite music from yellow card comes from. Honestly, there are so many solid pop punk bangers from this era that I still listen to regularly. Here I Am Alive, Always Summer, Hang You Up, Awakening for You and Your, Denial, Lift a Sail, it's a really, really good album, Lift a Sail, actually. Uh, Transmission, Home, Crash the Gates, Make Me So. I would say that Southern Air, their 2012 album, is definitely their most banging album, and the critical reception definitely reflects this as well. After they got back together in 2010, they toured rigorously with huge pop-punk bands. They did co-headlining tours with Newfound Glory, Less Than Jake, 
all time low. I think they also did a tour with Good Charlotte as well 10 years ago. They were really on a roll during this time and it seemed like the only unfortunate event that happened during that time period, the 2010 to 2016 era of Yellow Card, was Sean's cancer diagnosis, obviously. Especially considering when you're a vocalist, a vocalist, that's, that's no easy thing, to put it lightly. However, thankfully, it didn't hinder his performances, and he has mentioned that he obviously had a great support system and band around him, so everything seemed pretty good after they got back together. But as my grandmother says, all good things have to come to an end. And Yellow Card inevitably played their final show in early 2017. It just made sense at this point. Obviously the final few years seemed like more of a passion project than an actual career path. Because as Sean said, he could make more money selling cards and he would get to be with his family. I mean, it must be nuts when you're Yellow Card and you're touring in the UK, then you're going to France, then you're going to Germany, then you might go to Asia or Australia and then Canada when you just want to be home with your family and make more money. It just makes sense. 14 years before this, they'd had Believe, Breathing, Miles Apart, Life of a Salesman, Ocean Avenue, Only One, Way Away, all getting played. And there is just no way as a band you can top that level of success, especially 14 years afterwards. They're not going to capture the glory of those earlier shows and those earlier tours, especially as so many of Yellow Card's tours were overseas. And if you've watched my interviews with other bands such as Issues or Icy Stars, you know that touring overseas is expensive. Sometimes you don't even break even. You've got to pay for tour buses or tour vans. You've got to pay for hotels, you've got to pay for transport, you've got to pay for flights, you've got to pay for crew, uh, you've got to pay for merchandising, you've got to pay the venues, you've got to pay for technicians, all of this stuff. And I sometimes I've heard stories of bands coming to the UK from America and actually having to ask fans, ask fans of the band to buy them food because they've already blown all their money on alcohol or something ridiculous like that. The record label which you're on or your band as a whole is gonna have a certain budget. And once you go over that budget, it's coming out of your own pocket. And you really think when you're in your late 30s or about to turn 40, you still want to be doing this. Not earning as much money as you could elsewhere, potentially as maybe a session musician in Ryan's case, or a car salesman in Sean's case. Scraping by, tired, jet lag, long flights, uncomfortable hotels, tour buses, family at home far away from you. Ryan also was going through a separation at the same time, I think. All kinds of stuff. It just didn't make sense to be a band any longer. So that is it. That is the strange and slightly turbulent history and fairly unfortunate history of Yellow Card, but also very successful career of Yellow Card. Now the video is not quite finished Yet, there is one more thing that I need to talk about, and you guys probably already know what it is. But with Yellow Card, it goes without saying, whilst it lasted, it was incredible. There are not many pop punk bands who, in their time as a band, were able to release that many albums, go on that many tours, sell out that many venues, make that much money, have that larger of a following. Many of these bands from the 2001 to 2005 era, or even earlier, sometimes the skate punk 90s era, are just not relevant at all anymore. You might see them at a festival or playing a small venue somewhere. You might see them playing to a tiny crowd in a tiny bar somewhere. It's just not feasible and none of them have nowhere near the amount of success that Yellow Card had. So yes, I couldn't make this video without mentioning the Juice World lawsuit. So I'm sure most of you watching know what that was, but for those of you who don't, Yellow Card filed a $15 million lawsuit against Juice World because they thought that their song, Hollywood Died, sounded similar to Juice World's Lucid Dream. In my opinion, this was wrong on so many levels and it definitely somewhat, at least a little bit, tarnished their reputation as a band. Particularly as Hollywood Died is track 14 on, I would say, their worst performing album. So it's not even likely that Juice World ever heard it. And the other ironic thing is that Juice World in Lucid Dream was clearly sampling a 1993 Sting song. So Yellow Card did drop the lawsuit a little while after Juice World's tragic death. And even though it seemed like a bit of a messed up thing to do, we could give them 
the benefit of the doubt. We could say that maybe their management made them file the lawsuit. The record label really wanted to, perhaps. It could be that Capitol Records were doing it, although that's highly unlikely considering that it's been sold off to a different record label now. But my theory for this, and this is a little bit weird, right, is that Ryan and Sean no longer follow each other on Instagram. They don't seem to communicate anymore since the breakup, and there could be some post-breakup animosity here. Perhaps they blame each other for the breakup. On top of that, we know that Ryan Key did not have a good relationship with Ben Harper, and he was another person involved in the lawsuit because obviously he was still in the band when 2005's Lights and Sounds was released. So, I don't know about that. It seems a little bit strange. If you don't get along with this guy, and you don't get along with that guy, and these two don't get along, then why on earth are you gonna be like, hey guys, you know what we should do? We should fire a $15 million lawsuit. I think there was something else there. Maybe it was just one member of the band filed the lawsuit and he had to ask the other's permission. We, we don't know. The only people who will ever know for certain are Yellow Card, and their lawyers, sadly. It does seem a bit weird. It could have been an external factor. It's unlikely, but that's all I will say about that. Awesome, guys. Thank you so much for watching today's video. One more time, if you hit the subscribe button, that would be the most legendary thing that you can do for the channel. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.